Here we'll discuss our first hypothesis test, the z-test. First recall that the normal or Gaussian probability distribution is given by this formula and has this general shape. As we've discussed, the mean of the distribution is mu, which gives the position of the peak, and the standard deviation is sigma, which gives the width. For theoretical reasons, namely the central limit theorem, and practical reasons, since many real distributions look like a normal curve, we will look at the hypothesis test for experimental data which is assumed to be normally distributed. First we have to deal with the fact that experiments may measure quantities with very different numerical values, for example height in centimetres and weight in micrograms, but the corresponding distributions may still be normal. In order to answer questions about how unusual particular data points are, we standardise the data. There are two steps. First we subtract the mean, then we divide by the standard deviation. Our original data xi is transformed into zi, where zi is equal to xi minus mu over sigma and the zi are said to be standardised. Using standardised variables makes observations easier to interpret. For example, if average height for males is 175 centimetres with standard deviation 7 centimetres, this is roughly what the values are for England, then an individual who is 170 centimetres has a standard score or Z score of Z is equal to 170 minus 175 over 7, which is minus 0.71. This Z score will be the same regardless of if we change their units to feet or inches or miles. If rather than a single measurement we have n measurements, say the heights of everyone in a classroom, we can compute the z-score for the class using z is equal to x bar minus mu over sigma times the square root of n. Sigma over the square root of n is the standard, standard error and x bar is the sample mean. To understand why we divide by the root of n, we introduce the idea of a sampling distribution. Say we measure the heights of 10 people. We wouldn't expect the mean invariance to exactly equal the population mean invariance. If we measured multiple groups of 10 people and bin the results, we would be approximating a different statistical distribution, called a sampling distribution. We want to know the mean and variance of the sampling distribution. To warm up, let's start with calculating the mean, which involves estimating this expectation. x1, x2 and so on are the different measurements which make up our sample. We are going to use the linearity of expectation, so have a look at the previous video if, on probability if you need a refresher on that, but basically it says that the expectation of the sum is the sum of the expectations. The other property of expectation we'll use is the ability to pull out constant factors from inside square brackets. Again, review the previous video if this isn't clear. Now we use linearity. Remembering that the expectation of each measurement is just the population mean mu, we can replace each factor with mu, do the algebra, and find that the sample expectation is also mu. To compute the variance of the sampling distribution, I need to pause here and introduce something called the variance sum law. Just like we know how to deal with the expectation of a sum of variables, there is a simple formula for the variance of the sum. We start off with a definition of variance. Again, if you need a refresher, look back at the previous videos. The rest of the calculation is basically just using linearity of expectation and expanding all the squares. Then grouping things together and using the definition of variance. The final term here defines something called covariance, which is very closely related to correlation. Here we're going to assume that the samples are uncorrelated or independent. In this case, it can be shown that the covariance vanishes. And we're left with the result that, for independent variables, the variance of the sum is the sum of the variance. We'll also use this formula here for computing how the variance changes when we multiply by a random variable by a constant. I'll leave proving this as an exercise for anyone interested. Now we'll use this law to estimate the variance of the sampling distribution. The calculation is basically the same as for expectation, and we get that the variance of the sampling distribution is the variance of the population divided by the number of samples. Taking the square root of the variance gives a standard deviation, and this is where the formula for the z-score of a sample comes from. Let's do a simple example of hypothesis testing with z-scores. Say we measure the average height of a basketball team of 5 players to be 200 centimetres. Then, using the UK mean and variance from before, z is equal to 200 minus 175 divided by 7 over the square root of 5, which is about 8. This is very high. We expect z to be normally distributed with mean 0 and width 1. A value of 8 is very implausible, implying that basketball players are a significantly different population. This kind of analysis is the basis for the z-test. Using the z-score, we can do a very simple hypothesis test. Let's try to prove that basketball players are tall. This is the 2017-2018 roster for the Golden State Warriors. I don't follow, follow basketball at all, so I have no idea who they are, but they all seem pretty tall. Let's define our null and alternative hypothesis. The null hypothesis is that basketball players are a random sample of the general population, and the alternative is that basketball players are tall, that is, they're drawn from a different population with different average height. We should choose a significance level in advance, so we're going to use alpha equals 0.01, and since we only care about deviations in one direction, we'll do a one-sided test. Given the significance level, we have to calculate the z-score which corresponds to that threshold. 
For the standard normal distribution, by measuring the area under the curve, we find that 68.27% of the data values are between minus 1 and 1, shown in orange, 95% of the data is between minus 2 and 2, and 99.73 is between minus 3 and 3. To compute these numbers requires evaluating a complicated integral, but it won't surprise you to know that there are many functions and tables that have already computed these critical values. For our chosen value of alpha, we want to know the value of z such that the area in blue is less than 0.01. One way to find this is to use the scipy stats function ISF, which stands for inverse survival function. This is a function which takes its significance values and finds the point at which the area under the curve is equal to alpha. Executing the code shown should return 2.32. We can now calculate the test statistic, which is z equals 2.03 minus 1.75 over the square over 7 divided by the square root of 16, which is the z score, which is roughly 16. Since 16 is greater than 2.32, we can reject the null hypothesis, and therefore basketball players are not average height. The idea of the z score and the z test are quite intuitive. However, their key weakness is that they assume that we know the true population mean and standard deviation, and that the distributions are normal. For cases where, for example, we have small sample sizes or don't know the population values, these assumptions can be violated, and we need to use a different type of hypothesis test.